Well, if you would turn with me in your Bibles, we're going to be looking at John 10, uh, verses 1 through 30. And the title of my sermon today is The Effectual Shepherd. As you turn, good job, Micah, uh, by the way. And, uh, actually, a double good job. Thank you, Micah. If you guys don't know, my team in the flag football game on Saturday was hurting for numbers, okay? And Micah was not on my team, but yet he chose to play a second game back-to-back on my team and help my team get to the championship. So thank you, Micah. Uh, but yeah, we'll be looking at John 10, verses 1 through 30. And so let's go ahead and read. I won't be reading the whole thing, but skip down with me because it's a lengthy passage. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not the shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life for the sheep that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now skip down with me to verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I you, but you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. I am the Father of one. Let's pray. Father, you're good. Your word is good. And, and we are not... Father, help us to see you as great in this passage today. See Christ as great in this passage today. Help us to bow the knee to Scripture. To say, as Martin Luther did, that your word is great and that our conscience is captive to it. So help us, God. Give me grace in my inadequacy and glorify yourself today. Jesus, name I pray. So, who here played Manhunt as a kid? Okay. Uh, so, if you're like me, playing Manhunt in my neighborhood growing up, it wasn't just normal hide and seek. If they find you and they, they get you, then you're found and it's done. There was a base you had to get to once you're found, and depending on how aggressive we were feeling, you'd either have to be tagged or maybe tackled also, okay, before getting into that base. And so here's a scene, I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but I'd be hiding and I'm like, nobody's gonna find me. I'm in like the perfect spot in my backyard, right? Nobody's gonna find me. And then all of a sudden they find me and I jump out of wherever I'm hiding and I'm gonna make it to the base. And there's no way anybody's gonna catch me. I'm jumping over stuff, I'm juking them out, I'm trying to get there and I'm just about to get to the base. And then I hear Silas Joseph works. Dinner's ready. Stop in my tracks immediately. <laughs> I mean, if she called him Silas, that's one thing. But when my mom called Silas Joseph Words, full name, I know it's serious, right? <laughs> as soon as my mom called my new name, I knew it was her voice. And, and no matter where I was, I could hear her voice. And I knew it was her voice for two reasons. One, I knew what her voice sounded like. 
And two, she called me by my name. She, she didn't call the other kids. She called me by my name. Silas Joseph works. Come inside. So today we're going to look at another call, the call of the good shepherd. And this shepherd doesn't just let things happen by chance. He's purposeful and effectual. He calls his sheep. He dies for his sheep. And he keeps his sheep to the end. And so we're going to look at four things today in this text briefly. One, the effectual call. Two, the effectual death. Three, the effectual keeping. And lastly, we're going to jump off actually to John 11 briefly and look at the effectual resurrection. So let's jump right in, one through nine. The effectual call. Jesus says in the very beginning, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief. And a robber. So let me pose a question. How do false teachers make their living? Well, mainly by telling people that there's another way. So what Jesus kind of describes here in the picture is that there's a sheepfold and there's a door. You only get in through that door. And there's a shepherd, and he's calling a sheep by name and leading them out through that door to come in and out and find pasture. And you have these thieves and robbers that seemingly get in another way. Not through the door, seemingly. That's what thieves and robbers do. And then they stand and they're calling people in, right? <clears throat> you can be saved this way. Climb in this way. You don't need to go through the door. You can be saved by climbing in another way. Maybe through church attendance or giving to church or, or making a decision, reciting a prayer. The scripture's clear. There's one way that people are saved. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's one way that people are saved, and he has a name. It's Jesus. So there's a sheepfold and a door. You only get in through the door, and the shepherd calls his sheep by name and leaves them out. So Jesus is the door, and in this passage, he also calls himself the shepherd. So he's both. Not only is Jesus the way to be saved if you enter through him, but he's the one who has the authority to bring people to himself and be saved. And he calls, the passage says, he calls the sheep by name. So there are two types of calls, mainly in the scriptures. You have the general, what we call the general call, and then what we call the effectual call. Now, the general call looks like this. Come anyone who will and be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Every gospel presentation is what we would call a, call, a general call. Call falls under that category of general call. God commands all men to come to Jesus and repent and be saved, Acts 17.30. The effectual call, though, looks like this. Come, Gabe, and be saved. Come, Nate, and be saved. Insert whatever name. Come, Logan, and be saved. We share the general call, but it's God's job to call effectually. So why is a gospel presentation given to a crowd of a thousand people and maybe only 50 are saved? What's the general call versus the effectual call? And God uses the general call to accomplish his effectual call. So the goats hear the call of the gospel, but they don't recognize it. But when the sheep hear it, they hear their name. That's for me. Yes, I hear you. He calls his sheep by name and they follow him. And, and there's no, well, he, he calls them by name, but Maybe they won't follow him. No, they will. Verse 3, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So there's a type of calling that does guarantee justification and salvation. Romans 8.30, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. So if, if everyone is called in this way that Romans 8 just said, then everyone would be justified. Those whom he called, he justified. We know that, sadly, there are people who reject Christ. There are people who are not justified. Verse 5, a stranger, they will not follow. They do not know the voice of strangers, but they know the voice of their good shepherd. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So this type of drawing results in being raised up on the last day. If we skip down to verse 26 and 27 in our passage today, we say, see Jesus say this, but you do not believe, talking to the Pharisees, because you are not among my sheep. 
my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And so I used to read this just kind of ignorantly and, and think that he says, you are my sheep because you don't believe. But that's not what he says. The reason they don't believe, the reason they don't hear is because they aren't sheep. You don't become a sheep by believing. You believe because you are a sheep. 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. When he calls his sheep, they hear him. And when they hear him, they follow him. And, and a sheep may hear a general call 50 times in their life and reject it every single time. But when the good shepherd decides to call his sheep by name, his sheep hear and they will believe. So when you've been sharing the gospel with a friend for 10 years and they still reject it, don't lose hope. Don't give up. It's not up to you anyway. It's not in your strength anyways. In his time, God will call his sheep and save them. Lastly, shepherds don't wait for the sheep to initiate. They're the responders. Shepherds initiate by calling their sheep. Why? Sheep are stupid. <laughs> sheep are dumb. It's not, it's not a compliment that we are called the flock, that we're called sheep. It feels that way sometimes. If the shepherd doesn't call his sheep, guess what? His sheep won't come to him. Back to John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So when my mom called me, I knew her voice. Not only did I know her voice, but I knew she called me because she called me by my name. God's effectual call cannot fail. The good shepherd calls his sheep by name, and they come out and follow him. The effectual call. Next, 10 through 18, we're going to be looking at the effectual death. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So there is a theological question that is sure to cause debate in many settings. The question is this, for whom did Christ die? So here's what we're going to do. If you're for limited atonement that side, unlimited this side, now we're going to debate. I'm joking. <laughs> we're not going to do that. We're not going to debate today. We're not going to solve the debate today, but we are going to look closely at what Jesus says in the text and, and point out some things that, that are clear. Now, we would be foolish to excuse the fact that the atonement has a universal or global aspect to it, however you interpret it. First John 2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. John three sixteen for God so loved the world. That he gave his only son, that all the believing ones, as it says in the Greek reads, that all the believing ones, all those who believe, should not perish but have eternal life. So you can look at you can look at any person and say, Jesus died for you. Repent and believe the gospel and be saved, and not be lying to them. It's a legitimate offer. But we would also be foolish to ignore the verses where Jesus or Paul gets specific. And that's exactly what Jesus does in our passage today. Let's look at what Jesus says, verse 10, with me. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, they, who's they? The sheep. He came that his sheep may have life and have it abundantly. So he came that his sheep would have life. Now, how does he accomplish this? Say with me here. The sheep having life. How does he accomplish the sheep having life? By dying. Verse 11, next verse. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So his sheep have life abundantly by him, the good shepherd, taking their place in death. Continue in verse 12. He who is a higher hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves and flees. And the wolf snatches and scatters them. He flees because he is a higher hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So here's a time where Jesus gets specific. When the wolf comes, Jesus says, take my life instead of my sheep's. The sheep live because their good shepherd died. Not, not the other sheep, the hired hand and his sheep, verses 12 through 13, he was a hired hand and not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves. He flees. The hired hand leaves his sheep and they perish, but not the good shepherd. The shepherd's death didn't make the salvation of the sheep possible. It guaranteed it. 
Just like the call of the shepherd didn't just make them coming to him a possibility, it guaranteed that they would follow him. So brothers, <coughs> there was no hoping on the cross. There was no question in Jesus' mind. He was saving his sheep. Hebrews 9, 12, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Not making eternal redemption possible, but securing an eternal redemption. And so there's one thing that's, that's vastly clear. When the atonement is talked about in relation to the world, there's not a guarantee put on it. But when the atonement is talked about for the church, for the sheep, it's not just an offer of salvation. It's the guarantee of salvation. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus' death for his bride accomplished her washing and made her holy and blameless. Or what about Acts 20, 28? Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained but that word can be bought in the Greek, bought with his own blood. He didn't obtain the world or buy the world with his blood. Maybe in one sense he did die for the world with his blood to purchase the offer, but his blood didn't purchase the world truly. It purchased his church, the church that he obtained with his blood, that he bought with his blood. And we know he couldn't have purchased the world with his blood. So, you know, no matter where you stand, we have to come to the conclusion that Jesus didn't actually accomplish the forgiveness of sins, reconciliation, the barren and wrath of God for the whole world. If he did, then why do men burn in hell for sins that Jesus already paid for on the cross? Because they reject him? Well, that's his sin too, which means if you tie for all the sins of everyone that's ever existed, that would include their sin of rejecting him. And God would be unjust to punish people for sins that he already punished Jesus for on the cross. A part of me wishes I could read this text and it say, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the world. It would be easier. But it doesn't say that. And I'm under obligation to preach the word. So we would do well when we come to tough things in the scriptures like this to lay down our pride, bow our knee to scripture, say, I might not know how this works fully. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And then we see the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We might not know how all this works, but we can trust that the scriptures are true. And we can trust in looking at this passage that Jesus is the good shepherd and know that Jesus lays down his life for his sheep. Next, verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. So when Jesus says other sheep, he's referring to Gentiles. I have sheep in the Jewish fold, and I have sheep in the Gentile fold. And I'm going to bring them too. And so here we see the effectual death and the effectual call linked together. Not only does the good shepherd lay down his life for the sheep, but he goes and gets his sheep. I must bring them also. Praise God for John 3, 16. All the believing ones, remember the sheep are the ones who believe. You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep believe. All the sheep from all across the world, every tribe and tongue, Jews and Gentiles alike, are brought into the fold and believe. Revelation 5, 9. And they sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and tongue and language and people and nation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that all of those who believe should not perish but have eternal life. Lastly, before we go on to our next point, and I, and I almost did this as a whole point, because it goes, but it, it goes along with the effectual death, is the effectual mission. 17 and 18, the effectual mission. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. The mission that Jesus was sent by the Father to accomplish was that he would call his own, die for his own, and save his own sheep. And Jesus says here, the Father loves him for it. 
John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Call it a covenant, call it an agreement, call it what you want. Jesus came to do the will of his Father and give his life a ransom for sinners, for sheep. And we'll see in our next point that he keeps his sheep to the end. The hired hand sees the wolf coming and flees. But the good shepherd willingly sees the wolf, could beat the wolf, has the power to, but willingly gives his life in place of his sheep. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the, the iniquity of us all, the effectual death. Next, 19 through 30, the effectual keeping. And we don't have time to look in length at this section today. But look with me at verse 25. Jesus said, answer them. I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So if the Good Shepherd called his sheep, and the Good Shepherd died for his sheep, will he not keep his sheep? Bodhi Bauckham says, if we could lose our salvation, we would. The assurance of our salvation at the final day is not that we will hold on to God, but that he will hold on, God will hold on to us. The Father and the Son, <laughs> Jesus almost describes you, have a death grip on you with their hands, and they're not letting you go. The Father gives all of the sheep to Jesus. Jesus calls the sheep. Jesus dies for the sheep. And then the Father and the Son keep the sheep in their hands to the end. So here we say, see Jesus say, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Those who believe the sheep will not perish but have everlasting life. The effectual keeping. Lastly, the effectual resurrection. This is, I haven't seen anyone do this in preaching on John 10, so maybe I'm on shaky ground here. One of my favorite classes I've taken here at ABC is Matthew through Acts. Who here has taken Matthew through Acts? It's a wonderful class. And if you've taken Matthew through Acts, then you've heard Dr. Ranker say numerous times that the Gospels weren't written chronologically, right? They're written to prove theological points about who Jesus Christ is. True events ordered in ways that make points about who Jesus is. So the placement of parables, miracles, aren't by accident. Nothing's there by chance. Most times a miracle or a story will follow a discourse to expound on what has just been said to prove a point about Jesus. And so we see this in John 10 and 11. In John 10, <laughs> Jesus makes the case for him being the good shepherd. And in John 11, he actually shows that he's the good shepherd. So it's not by accident that Jesus raises Lazarus in the very next chapter. So let's walk through this just briefly and then we'll be done. In John 10, Jesus explains that the hired hand doesn't care about the sheep, but the good shepherd cares greatly for them. He is a hired hand and not a shepherd. Verse 12. Who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and flees. We've seen this. The hired hand cares nothing for the sheep, but Jesus isn't like the hired hand. Jesus lays down his life for the sheep, and so it couldn't be clearer, right? Jesus loves his sheep. Now look with me at John 11, verses 5 and then verses 35 and 36. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And 35 and 36. It's the first verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. So in chapter 10, Jesus shows that he cares greatly about his sheep. He says that the hired hand doesn't, but that he does. He cares. He loves his sheep. And then we see in chapter 11, Jesus shows this firsthand when he weeps. And they say, see how he loved him. Next. In John 10, Jesus says he'll go and find his sheep. He will go to his sheep. John 10, 16, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. The picture here is the shepherd going and bringing his sheep to him. In John 11, Jesus shows this, that he will go and get his sheep. John eleven fifteen. 15, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. His sheep is in trouble. And so in, in his timing, 
he goes to him. He's going to get his sheep that he loves so much. Lastly, in John 10, Jesus says that he calls his sheep by name, and they come out and follow him. John 10, 3-5, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, for they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. John 10, 26, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Follow him. So Jesus calls his sheep by name, and they come out and follow him. Well, look with me at John 11, 43-44. And he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. In John 10, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I call my sheep by name. They hear me and they follow me. And then in John 11, he stands outside the tomb and Jesus is like, you know how I said, my sheep hear my voice and they come out when I call them by name. Watch this. Jesus puts his money where his mouth is. He proves what he just claimed in the previous chapter. He calls his sheep by name, and they hear his voice, and they come out and follow him, even if they are dead. Jesus' call isn't optional. Jesus calls his sheep, and they come out to life and follow him. Brothers, Jesus calls dead sheep to life. Ephesians 5, or Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. Thanks be to God that when we as Christians were dead in trespasses and sins, Jesus, the effectual shepherd, called us by name and saved us by his grace. What do we do with this? I say we do three things and we'll be done. There's a couple of things that the effectual shepherd, I think, calls us to. The effectual shepherd calls us to life. The effectual shepherd calls us to work. And the effectual shepherd calls us to rest. The effectual shepherd calls us to life. He calls us by name and leads us into life. But that doesn't stop as salvation. Your effectual shepherd still calls you by name daily. And every time we open the word of God, we hear our effectual shepherd speak to us. And his sheep don't just hear his voice at the call to be justified. They hear his voice through the rest of their life. And so open his word often and let your shepherd speak to you. You hear his voice because you're a sheep. Be like Peter when he says, where else shall we go? You hold the words of eternal life. Next, the effectual shepherd calls us to work. Brothers, this doesn't change our gospel message. We preach the gospel to all. In fact, it gives confidence to our gospel message. My sheep hear my voice, so speak to everybody, and his sheep will hear and follow. Next, the effectual shepherd calls us to rest. He did everything. He called us. He died for us. He keeps us. This should eliminate all pride and self-reliance. Everything good in us is only from our shepherd. Rely on him like a dumb sheep to their amazing shepherd. Trust him. Rest in him. Let your loving shepherd lead you. Psalm 23. Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus, our good shepherd, who loves us so much. We thank you that he called us. We thank you that he gave his life in our place. We thank you that he keeps us to the end. We thank you that when we were dead in trespasses and sins, we were raised to life. 
We worship you for that. We ask that we would, you give us the awareness to give our lives in return for that. Jesus, we pray. Amen.